Hello YouTube. In this video we're going to continue looking at the debate concerning adaptationism. So in the recent literature a useful distinction has been drawn between different kinds of adaptationism. Broadly speaking there are three ways of being an adaptationist. First there is empirical adaptationism. This view holds that natural selection is the most powerful evolutionary force. It's relatively free from any constraints. Uh, and almost all features of organisms are shaped primarily by natural selection. Organisms will evolve nearly optimal uh, design, with any suboptimality being a result of trade-offs. If we want to explain the origin of a trait, most of the time uh, selection provides a sufficient explanation. Of course, this view must also hold that uh, the genetic mutation that provides variation uh, is also uh, ubiquitous and largely without limits so that there's enough material for selection to work on. So other forces of evolution like drift and migration and lateral gene transfer and so on are of comparably little importance. Now uh, S Stephen Orzak and Elliot Sober have suggested that we can test for empirical adaptationism by using uh, what they call censored models. So we, we develop models of phenomena to make predictions uh, about how those phenomena will develop. If we want to predict how rapidly ice in the Arctic will melt due to global warming, we create a model of the Earth, which includes uh, factors relevant to ice extent, such as uh, temperature and wind currents and ocean circulation and so on. Similarly, we can use models of populations of organisms to predict how they will develop. So if, adapt if empirical adaptationism is true, then a predictive model that includes only natural selection will be largely as good as the uncensored model that includes other evolutionary forces. Uh, if we can ac accurately predict how a population will change by appealing only to natural selection, uh, that would show us that selection is the primary evolutionary force. So the question is then, you know, can we ignore aspects other than selection and still have useful, accurate models? Empirical adaptationists will say, in general, yes, we can. Gould and Lewontin would say, no, we can't. We'll discuss empirical adaptationism in more detail shortly. The second, there is explanatory adaptationism. This is the view that the explanation of adaptation is the central problem for evolutionary theory. The main goal of evolutionary theory is to explain the origin of complex useful traits. We have a tendency to treat organisms as if they were produced by design. Various features of organisms like uh, eyes and hands and the uh, processes involved in the transcription of DNA and so on these features exhibit sophisticated structure and organisation that initially you would think must have been intentionally designed. And of course before Darwin many people like William Paley drew exactly that conclusion that you know, the, the incredible complexity and sophistication of organisms means they were products of design by, by a god. Um, so explanatory adaptationists say that the main task of evolutionary theory is the explanation of the appearance of design. And since natural selection is often the only plausible explanation of the appearance of design, it has a unique importance. The first question about this kind of view then is, should we focus primarily on adaptation? Uh, is, is that? You know, should, should that be the primary goal of evolutionary theory? Gould and Lewontin, of course, would say that adaptation is just one part of the natural world that requires explanation. Another uh, challenge, another thing that requires explanation, are the widespread similarities of structure, similarities that persist across uh, radically different lifestyles. So we talked about this before in the last video, but you know, cons consider, for example, the very similar structure of the Tyrannosaurus rex and the sparrow. I mean, if you look at uh, T. rex and sparrow skeletons, they have a number of substantial similarities, despite living tens of millions of years apart uh, and having very different lifestyles. Uh, it's the same with uh, any other bird and dinosaur. Uh, if we abstract a bit further, we can see that all vertebrate animals share a very general body plan. The uh, vertebral column, the central nervous system, uh, the nervous tissue derived from the ectoderm. Uh, all uh, vertebrates form gill arches during fetal development and so on. So a striking feature of the living world is the persistence of type, the conservation of basic body plans, and this doesn't seem to be explained by natural selection. So Gould and Lewontin would say that focusing 
on adaptation. Putting adaptation as the primary goal of evolutionary theory blinds us to an important part of biology. The other question about explanatory adaptation, adaptationism is even assuming that we should focus uh, on explaining adaptation, is selection uniquely uh, of unique importance in this? Well, in fact, so, some evolutionists have long suggested that other processes may play important roles in the development of adaptations. Uh, a simple case is what's known as shifting bal balance theory. So to understand this theory, it helps to visualise what's known as the adaptive landscape. Uh, on this image, uh, the horizontal axis represents... Uh, the horizontal axis here represents different phenotypes, and the vertical axis represents the fitness of those phenotypes. Higher points uh, on, the, on the vertical axis mean that the phenotype is fitter. And you can notice that we have peaks on this landscape. Uh, in this image, point B it represents the fittest possible phenotype, but there's another peak here at A, and there's another peak over here that's unlabeled. Now, natural selection acts to drive populations upwards. It drives them to higher and higher fitness. So if you have a population at this point, it will get driven to phenotype A. But notice that even though phenotype B is fitter, natural selection can't move the population to that peak because it would require going through less fit phenotypes. Natural selection can never drive a population downward. It only selects the fittest, not the less fit. Just as a, a little aside here, um, it may be worth checking out my video on fitness and natural selection that I uploaded recently, because in that video I, uh, we, we raise some problems about the notion of fitness, um, and so it may be worth watching that video and asking whether we can actually define fitness in a way that makes sense of this adaptive landscape metaphor, but, but that's a little bit tangential, tangential here. Uh, anyway, uh, recall in the last video we discussed genetic drift, which is a kind of uh, sampling error, uh, random changes in the proportion of, of alleles. Processes such as genetic drift can push a population into a valley, uh, an adaptive valley, so like this, they can, it can push a population downwards. Uh, and then selection can push it back up to a different peak. So uh, drift is, is most significant among small populations, so maybe uh, a, a small number of birds migrate to an island and then sea levels rise so they lose contact with the species on the mainland. Just by chance the gene pool of the island subpopulation will be different to that of the mainland. But genetic drift uh, allows populations to escape local adaptive optimums. If this theory is right, um, there is a significant role for non-selective forces in explaining adaptation. A mixture of selection and drift achieves better adaptations, it achieves greater fitness than selection alone. So even if we accept the claim that we should focus primarily on explaining adaptations, it doesn't necessarily follow that selection is therefore of unique importance. Okay, third, there is methodological adaptationism. This is the view that the best way to study organisms is to look for adaptations and selective explanations. Uh, adaptations may in fact be quite rare on this view, uh, and selection may be heavily constrained by other factors. Nevertheless, uh, adaptationism is a good organising concept for research. Adaptationism is a, a good way of doing biology. And it is clear how adaptationism can generate uh, useful hypotheses about traits. Uh, so we talked in the last video about how you know, we, we can consider a problem faced by the organism and propose a possible adaptive solution it may have, uh, or we can reverse engineer uh, the possible selective origin of a trait. These are, these are good, easy ways of generating hypotheses. Um, and although Gordon Lewontin argued that adaptationism in general was unfalsifiable, it's pretty clear that specific hypotheses about how certain traits are a product of selection are, are entirely falsifiable. Of course, there are, there are still problems uh, with with saying that we should focus primarily on, uh, that we should um, look for adaptations, there are cases where uh, adaptationism and, and this need to look, and this uh, goal of looking for adaptations has led us astray. Uh, and perhaps an interesting example here, which became popular after Gordon Lewontin's article was published, uh, is the discovery of the archaea. Traditionally, life was divided into two main groups, 
uh, the eukaryotes, which are distinguished by membrane-enclosed organelles, most notably a membrane-enclosed nucleus. And uh, the eukaryotes include the, the animals, the plants, the fungi, the protists, uh, and the prokaryotes, uh, the bacteria. These are uh, single-celled organisms that uh, do not have any membrane-enclosed organelles. Uh, in the late 70s, Carl, uh, Carl Woese and colleagues argued from, based on studies of uh, ribosomal RNA in certain forms of bacteria, that there are actually three major domains of life. There are the eukaryotes, the bacteria and the archaea. Archaea had been classified as bacteria, but in terms of their biochemistry and their evolutionary history, the archaea uh, are no closer to bacteria than they are to eukaryotes. In fact, some studies suggest that the archaea might actually be sister taxa to the eukaryotes, that they're more closely related to the eukaryotes, as shown in, in this tree here. Um, we can see that uh, if, you know, this is the root of the tree. Uh, the, eukary the eukaryotes and the archaea are more closely related than the archaea and the bacteria on this particular tree. Uh, I mean, that's controversial, but... Um, the point is there are three main domains of life. That's well accepted these days. Now, uh, most archaea that were studied in the 70s and 80s were extremophiles. They lived in very hot or very salty places, such as the hot springs around Yellowstone. Uh, and even before Wo uh, Woese's work, it was known that certain extremophile organisms had very unusual features. For example, bacterial cell walls all contain a uh, mesh-like polymer called peptidoglycan. And this was for a long time considered to be diagnostic of bacteria. It was thought that all bacteria had peptidoglycan. Uh, but the organisms that would later be classed as archaea were known to lack this. Uh, also, both bacteria and eukaryotes have similar membrane lipids. Uh, they're ester-linked, whereas the membrane lipids of archaea are ether-linked. And there are various other differences as well. So this, this group of bacteria, of well, what were thought to be bacteria, had very unusual features. But these differences were just assumed to be adaptations to extreme environments. Indeed, even the differences in ribosomal RNA that were discovered by Woese and his colleagues were initially explained as, again, adaptations to extreme environments. Um, biologists didn't recognise archaea. When they found these strange, or strange organisms, they just assumed that the strange features were adaptations. So there was, you know, you, they weren't indicative of a radically different evolutionary history. The adaptationist assumptions... Uh, obscured the importance of these features. If biologists at the time had approached organisms from a different perspective, so you know, the, the point of view of the bow plan, as Gould and Lewontin suggested, they might have recognised earlier that archaea was something special. Uh, so perhaps this is an example of how methodological adaptationism has its limits. Okay, let's uh, turn back to considering empirical adaptationism. John Wilkins and Peter Godfrey Smith, in their article Adaptationism in the Adaptive Landscape, suggest an interesting way to uh, dissolve the debate. Uh, they suggest that the parties in this debate have paid insufficient attention to the role of zoom or grain. Uh, and to explain what uh, Wilkins and Godfrey Smith uh, argue here, it helps to use the notion of the adaptive landscape, which we saw earlier, where uh, the horizontal axis represents possible phenotypes and the vertical axis represents fitness, with higher points meaning higher fitness. Whenever we consider an evolutionary problem, uh, we have to specify a grain of analysis. Taking a coarse-grained perspective, we consider longer time scales and larger sets of populations covering a very uh, wide range of alternative phenotypes, but without much depth. Uh, at a narrow grain, we look at short time scales and more mechanistic detail. Maybe uh, we, we might just examine the development and functioning of a few different organisms. Uh, so we get a lot of depth, but not so much breadth. And we can think of this in terms of specifying a region of the adaptive landscape. We can, in terms of zooming in or zooming out of the adaptive landscape. Um, if you take a larger region, you have uh, you have more alternative phenotypes, take a smaller region, you have more depth. 
Um, and this gives you different perspectives on evolutionary phenomena. Wilkins and Godfrey, Godfrey Smith suggest that natural selection has a special, special role at an intermediate grain of analysis, but not at the coarse or narrow grains. Basically, they say that adaptationists are right, but only at a specific grain of analysis. So consider first the, the, the kind of coarsest grain or the highest level of zooming out, where we cover the largest stretch of the adaptive landscape. At this level of zoom, we're going to ask questions such as, and I quote, how are organisms distributed in the space of possible organisms? What proportion of the landscape's peaks are occupied? Uh, to what extent are the occupied peaks the highest peaks? At this level, the landscape is largely empty. Throughout, uh, through, through all of Earth's history, very few of the possible fit phenotypes, uh, very few of the possible peaks in the adaptive landscape have actually been explored. In this image showing the adaptive landscape for two traits, uh, the black dots represent actual populations on the adaptive landscape, uh, and we can see that many peaks are unoccupied. Populations end up on uh, local peaks and are often prevented from spreading out to higher ones, and this is due to the action of various historical and developmental constraints, as we've already discussed. Uh, Wilkins and Godfrey Smith think that this is the kind of picture we're, we're going to get at this level of zoom. So adaptationism doesn't really seem appropriate here. But now suppose that we zoom in to an area containing one or uh, a few peaks. Uh, in this case, we're examining specific species of organisms and asking how that species as a whole changes over time. And what we'll find is that populations cluster around the local peaks. Selection keeps the population near the peaks. We can sort of say that you know, given a population in this particular region, we can expect to find it near the peak, as shown here. Uh, and we, we can expect also that uh, the environment will change, right? So a phenotype that is uh, adaptive at one time will become unadaptive later. So, you know, you have to imagine the, lands the adaptive landscape constantly, uh, constantly shifting and moving. And what's going to happen at this level, what we see at this level, is selection will constantly be driving populations up, up, to, up to the peak, up to peaks on the adaptive landscape. Uh, so uh, most evolutionary studies at this level of zoom are going to place a very high importance on natural selection. Uh, to, to, to go back to uh, Orzak and Sober's idea, at this level of zoom, a censored model that uses only selection is actually going to explain quite a lot of what we see. It's going to explain you know, how, how it is that we see these populations constantly moving up the peaks as the adaptive landscape shifts and changes. Populations will constantly find the peaks. But the important point to notice is that the select selective explanation at this level doesn't contradict the primarily non-selectionist explanation that we, we would have for, the high, for, for what we see at the higher levels of zoom. So let's uh, zoom in even further uh, so that we recognise not broad populations but individuals themselves. Uh, so at this level we're going to see specific individuals uh, in the uh, in the landscape as shown here these dots in the image represent specific individuals so the population is spread out over a wide area we will find that new individuals pop up at some distance from their parents um, you know because obviously you're very different to your parents so you're going to be in a different area of the adaptive landscape to explain evolutionary phenomena at this level we have to consider not just natural selection but also genetic drift gene flow mutation uh, for the microbes we have to consider horizontal gene transfer and so on um, plus uh, the effects of mendelian inheritance recombination of chromosomes during sexual reproduction and so on if we zoom in far enough we'll have to consider the specific idiosyncrasies of biochemistry Various complex processes account for the movement of individuals through the adaptive landscape. Random fluctuations, constraints due to the mechanism of inheritance, these are all important and they will all frustrate perfect adaptation. You're going to see that many individuals will be, will be far away from the peaks just because of these, all of these other processes. Uh, now, Wilkinson and Godfrey Smith illustrate this with the case of sickle cell anemia. 
Sickle cell anemia causes red blood cells to be distorted into a sickle shape, and therefore they don't flow through the veins and arteries so easily. And it occurs in people who carry two alleles of uh, a mutant haemoglobin beta chain gene. Uh, people with only one allele are unaffected. Uh, and the reason why this mutant gene is prevalent is because it confers malaria resistance. So individuals who are heterozygous for the gene, so they have one uh, normal allele and one mutant allele, they have both malaria resistance and relatively normal blood. And therefore, they, they are the fittest in places with malaria. So that's shown on, on this chart. The capital R is the normal allele and the uh, small r is the mutant allele. So we can analyse sickle cell anemia at various levels. Consider, first of all, the, the closest level of zoom. Uh, so we, we, we zoom right in and we're looking at specific individuals. Here we're examining a single population at short timescales. And we've seen that the optimum condition, the best adapted condition, is the heterozygote uh, of one normal allele and one mutant allele. Imagine a population of heterozygotes where everybody is the best adapted. Well, it's clear that Mendelian inheritance inevitably produces individuals who are homozygous for uh, the normal and for the mutant alleles, resulting in either a loss of malaria resistance or in sickle cell anemia, uh, as shown in this little diagram. The optimum condition of the heterozygote is constantly disrupted. So we have very strong constraints on adaptation just because of the mechanism of the reproductive process. But now suppose we zoom out to an intermediate level. So we're looking at various populations over longer time scales. If you imagine a population that has just the normal allele, uh, a, muta a mutation event occurs introducing heterozygous resistance to malaria, well this clearly improves the fitness of the population, and so it pushes the population higher up the adaptive landscape. Uh, and selection for the heterozygous condition keeps it at this peak, despite the fact that other processes disrupt the heterozygous condition, selection is, is keeping it at the peak. And furthermore, it's clear that looking at things uh, at a slightly longer time scale, we can expect that sooner or later, another mutation event will probably occur that, uh, that sort of breaks the link between malaria resistance and sickle cell anemia. So uh, there'll, there'll be a mutation that protects against malaria without causing sickle cell anemia, um, just because you know, on, on longer time scales, new variations, new mutations arise in the population that can break uh, biological constraints that obtain on shorter time scales. If we zoom out further, however, adaptation recedes again, because we could imagine a species much like us, but whose immune system is uh, completely differently structured so that it can more easily defeat malaria. There are uh, general historical and developmental constraints on species. Our immune system is one part of a general body plan, which has uh, you know, it's based on a basic structure that has been around for hundreds of millions of years. May not, there may not be any particular reason to think that it is an optimum structure in any way. Wilkins and Godfrey Smith uh, suggest then that to a, to a large extent, biologists have been talking past each other. Evolutionary theory uh, was largely built on organismal biology. You examine uh, populations of organisms over intermediate timescales and see how they develop. Think of classic studies like Kettlewell's moths. Well, at this intermediate scale, selection is indeed a uniquely powerful force. But there are other perspectives you can take. And once you specify the grain of analysis, um, Wilkins and Godfrey Smith think that the disagreements about adaptationism will largely subside. So I think that's a pretty, uh, pretty interesting idea, interesting way of looking at the debate. OK, what I'd now like to do is look at a couple of, uh, I guess, limits to adaptationism in in standard biology. An important part of uh, evolutionary theory is uh, phylogenetics, which involves trying to infer the evolutionary relationships between different species. This is a tree which shows the evolutionary history of various species. Um, and we can see that, for example, the pigeon and the crocodile uh, share, have, a, have a more recent common ancestor than the pigeon and the mouse. Uh, so pigeons are more closely related to crocodiles than they are to mice, which is may perhaps be a little bit surprising because I suppose pigeons seem more like mice than they do like crocodiles, but, you know, that's th those are the facts. Um, 
So how do we infer evolutionary history? One obvious option is to look at the fossil record. The problem here is that the fossil record is highly incomplete, so we need other methods. Phylogeneticists use uh, what's known as the method of parsimony. And this method is essentially an application of Occam's razor, uh, the, the claim that the, the simplest explanation is to be preferred. It tells us uh, that the phylogenetic tree that best represents true evolutionary history is the one with the fewest evolutionary changes. Here's an example from uh, Douglas Futuyama's evolution textbook. These are two trees showing the uh, possible evolutionary history of whales. Um, we might think, when we initially look at whales, that whales are more closely related to fish, such as tuna, than they are to uh, mammals and other tetrapods. Uh, and this is represented on this tree on the left. We have the whales most closely related to the tuna. But then we have to assume that a whole host of characteristics, which are listed here, evolved, uh, evolved separately, evolved twice in the tetrapod, uh, but in, in the tetrapod and mammalian lineage, and then in the whale lineage. We have a much more parsimonious tree by assuming that whales evolved from mammals, and that the characteristics they shared with fish were what evolved twice. So when we use this method of parsimony, constraint is the default assumption. The, the default assumption is that things don't change. And notice that if selection were without limits, if selection did indeed produce perfectly optimal organisms, then all the traces of shared ancestry would be completely destroyed. We would never know that whales were mammals, because all the characteristics of whales would be perfectly suited to their aquatic environment. So it seems that phylogenetics takes a kind of zoomed out view of the adaptive landscape, where historical constraints have a central role. A very interesting program in recent evolutionary theory is evolutionary developmental biology, or EvoDevo. Uh, this focuses on the genetics of developmental programs, and it's provided, uh, I think, quite a lot of empirical support to Gordon Lewontin's discussion of developmental constraint. EvoDevo Evo Devo took off with the discovery of Hox genes, which are found in all animals and which control the differentiation of body regions. Uh, they control the basic body plan of the embryo. Each uh, different body segment along the anterior-posterior axis is controlled by different Hox genes. Uh, the Hox genes determine how the body is organised. They are uh, regulatory genes, so they, they code for molecules that control the expressions of other genes. Uh, essentially, they switch other genes on or off. A way to think about how Hox genes work is that they, they kind of direct other genes. They say, put an eye here, or put a leg here, but they don't, uh, they don't say how to build an eye or a leg. Here's a diagram showing Hox gene expression in the fly Drosophila. Notice that the order of different genes on the chromosome uh, matches the order of the body segments. Um, it's quite interesting how they, they line up in that sort of linear fashion. Normal flies have uh, one pair of wings on their second thoracic segment and then uh, small structures called halteres on their third thoracic segment. But a mutation in the ultrabithorax Hox gene, which controls the third uh, thoracic segment, can produce wings there, as shown in this image. Similarly, a uh, mutation in what's called the antennapedia gene can produce legs where antenna should be. What's really striking is that the Hox genes that are found in Drosophila are also present in other animals. Hox genes emerged very early in the animal lineage and they're strongly conserved. Uh, this diagram shows how the Hox genes of a fly embryo, which is at the top, correspond to uh, the Hox genes of a mouse embryo. As you can see, um, there's a lot of correspondence. Uh, other regulatory genes are also highly conserved. A striking example uh, is the gene that controls eye development. Uh, here are the DNA sequences for the eye control gene and the amino acids that the sequences code for uh, in various animals. Uh, you can see that the DNA sequences are very, very similar and the, um, the amino acids that they code for are exactly the same. Uh, they're exactly the same amino acids in mice, uh, flies, sharks, very different animals, but 
the gene is is almost exactly the same. Uh, in the mid nineties, uh, the biologists Rebecca Quering and Walter Gehring did some interesting experiments. So they took the Pax six gene, which controls eye development in mice, and they placed it at various sites in the genome of a Drosophila fly. This led to the development of eyes in various parts of the fly. So, you know, there were flies with eyes under their wings or eyes on their legs. Interestingly, though, the mouse gene produced insect eyes. So, uh, mammals have a camera type eye, whereas insects have a compound eye. It's a very different kind of eye. But the Pax6 gene from a mouse inserted into a fly produced uh, insect compound eyes. So, these regulatory genes are very similar in different animals. Uh, it would take a whole series to explore EvoDevo properly, but it should be clear that this uh, seems to lend support to Gould and Lewontin in a couple of ways. First, it undermines the prevalence of uh, convergent evolution. Convergent evolution occurs when the same trait evolves independently. And it was originally believed that the eyes of flies and mice and squid, for example, must have evolved independently, just because they're you know, so different. Indeed, I think Ernst Meyer uh, once estimated that eyes evolved about 40 times independently in the animal kingdom. So what we have in these cases of convergent evolution are similar adaptations arising over and over and over again. Um, if, if, if eyes arose 40 times independently, then that's a lot of adaptations. But this uh, EvoDevo research suggests that these different eyes may not be independent after all, because the eye development genes are the same across different species, which would suggest that there's less adaptation than we thought, and maybe um, constraint uh, plays a greater role here. Second, the work on Hox genes uh, seems to support Gould and Lewontin's claim that there are bowel plans. Uh, basic body plans and basic developmental pathways that are strongly conserved. When we examine uh, animals that on the surface might appear quite different, we find really striking similarities in terms of their general morphological structure and in terms of the genes that control the development of that structure. So in many ways then, EvoDevo seems to be very much in line with what Gould and Lewontin were, were arguing. One point that I do want to raise, though, is that it, it seems that EvoDevo doesn't support Gould and Lewontin's critique of atomization. So remember that Gould and Lewontin objected to the way that adaptationism treats organisms as collections of traits rather than integrated wholes. But one of the foundational claims of EvoDevo is modularity, uh, which is the claim that the pathways that govern the development of different body parts operate largely independently. And we've seen that merely moving one gene from a mouse to a fly can grow an eye on the fly's leg. And that doesn't really disrupt the development of anything else. Everything else uh, just carries on developing as normal, but you just got an eye on the leg. So organisms don't seem to be strongly integrated in the way that Gould and Lewontin suggested. At least that, it seems to me, is what a lot of research in EvoDevo is suggesting. So um, that is... That is the end of that. I hope you found that interesting, um, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.